Recording has begun. Emma, go ahead. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Evaluation, Don't Submit Your ATE Proposal Without It. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the ATE Evaluation Resource Center at Western Michigan University. For those of you who are attending our session at attended our session at high tech or visited our booth welcome this webinar will give you a more in-depth view of what we were able to cover in our session and handouts i am emma perk and i will be the moderator for today's webinar with me here at western michigan university in kalamazoo michigan is lori wingate the director of evaluate Behind the scenes, making sure this webinar runs smoothly, we have Mike Lezecki, Janet Pinhorn, and Tim Suchomsky from Maytech at Maricopa Community Colleges. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. The materials from this presentation, including the evaluation planning checklist for NSF ATE proposals, the webinar and the webinar slides are available on our website. This webinar is also being recorded and you will be emailed the link to the recording and all the resources when it is available, which commonly takes one to two days. You may have noticed that we have moved our webinars to a new system called Adobe Connect. Now I'll take you on a brief tour to show you some features. We will have some poll, a few poll questions throughout the webinar. To answer a poll question, use the poll box located in the top right hand corner of your screen. So now I'll have you answer the poll, so go ahead and use the poll box in the top right hand corner and answer this question. Select the response that best describes you or your team today. So it looks like we have a pretty even run between submitting proposals and we have submitted. And we already have AT grants. Good. Well, it looks like you have a hang of the poll features and you can go ahead and show the results on those. So below the poll box then, which Tim will bring back up in just a moment, is the attendees box where you can see who's attending this webinar. And then below the attendees box is going to be the chat box where you can type questions and post comments throughout the webinar. And we do encourage you to ask questions and we'll have a question and answer break at the end of each section where we'll address those questions. So let's try using the chat box now. In the chat box, type the name of your organization and how many people are in the room with you today. Again, use the chat box for that one. Great, so it looks like we've located the chat box. One more tool I wanna show you today is going to be our marker tool. So in order to use the marker tool, you're going to use a drop down box that will appear on the left hand side of your screen. So let's go ahead and try that now. Tim, if you'll bring up the marker tools. There we go. So just select the marker box icon. And on this map, I want you to draw your location. Uh, if you're joining us from outside of the United States, mark your mark off the coast in the direction that you're coming from. So we have one dot in Michigan. I will go ahead and put another dot in Michigan. Go ahead and locate your marker tools. Again, you're going to have to select the marker icon right under the pointer feature for that. It's on your left side of the screen. I'm just going to give us another moment here to make sure everyone can find their marker tools because it is important that we find these because we'll have a lot of activity. So let me just go back a slide. Again, you're going to have your marker tool, which is going to pop up in the corner here. So go ahead and draw on your map. All right, we got a few more people coming in now. All right, so it looks like we have a hang with that and we have a hang with the new system. So we'll go ahead and move on. So since you all have registered for this webinar, you're probably familiar with the ATE program, but for those of you who are not, uh, ATE stands for the Advanced Technological Education Program, and of course, is how we NSF is how we refer to the National Science Foundation. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education. I'm sorry, slides are out of order. Um, so the ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. And the ATE program consists of three levels. 
The first level will be project grants, including program development, capacity building, and teacher preparation, to name a few. We also have targeted research grants, including planning, exploratory, and full-scale grants. And then we have center grants, including planning grants and support regional and national centers. Evaluate is a support center, and our mission is to provide evaluation support to all ATE grants. Today's webinar will focus on incorporating evaluation into your ATE proposal, and by the end of this webinar, you will be able to know what evaluation elements should be included in an ATE proposal and where, and also understand how a strong evaluation plan can strengthen an ATE proposal. So we just had the markers up, so let's bring them up one more time. And we're going to have you um, answer this based on the objectives I just read off, and they're also listed here on the screen again. So we'd like you to rate your current knowledge related to both of these objectives. So if you're completely new to the grant evaluation, you'd rate yourself on the a 1 here on the scale, indicating you're a complete beginner. Or if you're a little bit more experienced, you could rate yourself a 3 or 4. So go ahead and circle the one which best right now within this webinar. A wide range of people coming in and All right, and we will go ahead and ask you this question one more time um, to rate yourself as at the end. All right, so now I'm going to turn things over to Lori. I'm sorry, I got to jump slides here. I'm sorry, we're just having just a little technical difficulty. There we go. Slides are systems a little slow. Sorry about that. We'll get caught back up here. All right, now I'll turn it over to Lori. Lori. Emma, we don't hear Lori at this point. Okay. Yes. Hi, guys. <laughs> oh, there she is. Thank I, you, Lori. I had, I had two uh, mute buttons. I didn't realize I had to push both of them. Okay. Anyway, We're so open. I just want to thank you. Uh, th Mike, th thanks for letting me know that I was talking to no one there. So um, before we get into the content of today's webinar, we just have one more housekeeping point. So as you know, this is a free webinar, and we're able to bring it to you because of the support from the National Science Foundation. But like everyone else, we have to have an evaluation of our work. So we're going to ask for one small thing from you in return uh, for providing this free webinar. At the end of the webinar, we have a very short feedback survey. And this feedback that that you provide is so important to us, um, not only for our evaluation, but to help us learn how to improve. So before we proceed, just to underscore how important this is to us, I want you to take a moment to decide now if you think you're going to be able to participate in this really short survey, less than five minutes. And if you agree to do it, would you use your markers again to make a mark in this box just to show your commitment to do this? All right, thank you so much, everybody. Um, so, one month. so I'm pretty sure most of you are here today not because of a, a necessarily an academic interest in evaluation, um, but you know evaluation is a required element for an ATE proposal, and you want to know what you need to do and how you need to do that. But, and we're going to get to that. But first, what are we really talking about um, with this word evaluation? Um, I'm sure many of you have, are familiar with this story of a group of blindfolded people who are inspecting an elephant. This is a very common uh, tale, right? So they each have a limited perspective on this creature, and they come to very different conclusions about what it is, because none of them are seeing in it in, it, in its entirety. So I find evaluation is a lot like that. 
for example, when I tell people where I work, which is the Western Michigan University Evaluation Center, they'll say, oh, you do surveys or you do the course evaluations. So in this version of the, um, this cartoon, we see other common things that people equate with evaluation. And yes, it can be all of these things, but we want to take a broader view. And the generally agreed upon definition in the evaluation field is that it's the systematic determination of something's merit, worth, or significance. And in the context of the ATE program, we're talking typically about projects and centers, their quality, impact, effectiveness, and so forth. It's systematic because we go through a series of steps. First, we ask important questions about the project's processes, its outcomes, or other dimensions. And this is about focusing the evaluation. And we want to make sure we're using our evaluation resources to really concentrate and focus on the things that really matter. Next, we gather evidence that is going to help us answer those questions. Then we have to make sense of those data, we interpret the results, and answer the evaluation questions. And then we're able to use that information for accountability, improvement, and planning. But that's not really a final step, because the evaluation really should be used to inform decisions about that next project, the, ne the next in initiative, and the evaluation of that work. So with this overview in mind, let's now get down to the nitty gritty of what you need to do to build evaluation into your ATE proposal. Nearly all the information I'm going to share with you in this webinar is included in the checklist that Emma mentioned, which is on our website now. Um, and I emailed it uh, to everyone last, who was registered as of late yesterday afternoon, so maybe you've had a chance to look at it. Um, we've had this checklist around for a while. I just recently updated it um, to add a few more details and to give it uh, a new look with our nice new logo. So this is what it looks like, and it's organized around the proposal components. We don't have all the pro proposal components listed, just the sections where uh, information related to your evaluation is needed. And there's lots of links to other resources embedded in this checklist. So we've been doing a webinar on this topic for about the past seven years. And we've often had guest presenters and discussions with various perspectives. Um, and this time around, it's just Emma and me. So we didn't want you to miss out on, the, on those on the wisdom of all those folks before. So what we've done is interspersed throughout the webinar some words of wisdom that experienced members of the ATE community have shared in past evaluate webinars and newsletters and other resources. And as you can see here, there's evaluators, there's NSF program officers, as well as uh, Mike uh, Lisecki there in the uh, uh, top row on the far right, our friend at Maytech, who's a very experienced principal investigator, um, as well as a grant specialist, uh, Declan Reary. So lots of smart, experienced people um, giving some good advice on this webinar as well. So here are the required contents of an NSF proposal. And this is according to the NSF grant proposal guide. And if you haven't checked that out and you're thinking of putting an NSF proposal in, you definitely should. Um, as I mentioned, the ATE evaluation planning checklist is organized around these categories. And the check marks here identify the components of the proposal where there really should be information related to your evaluation. And we're going to be discussing how to incorporate evaluation into these sections um, to strengthen your proposal and increases, increase your chances for a good review. And I'm going to work through these components right in the order that you see them listed here, starting with the cover sheet. This document is automatically generated as you provide answers to questions in the Fastlane system. And you, many of you already know Fastlane is, is what we use to submit our proposals to NSF. So how does evaluation figure into the cover sheet? Well, it shows up here in the form of a box that you'll check if you're going to be collecting information from or about human subjects, more commonly known as people, um, as part of your project's evaluation or even your research efforts. If it isn't practical uh, for you to obtain approval from your institution's Human Subjects Institutional Review Board before you submit your proposal, and that's typically the case, um, you should indicate pending in this box here. Um, but note that you will need approval before the grant is awarded. So you'll want to move this process along um, as far as you reasonably can uh, so you don't have to scramble if you hear your proposal may be funded. 
And here we have some words of wisdom from a very wise man, Gerhard Salander, formerly the ATE program lead, um, co-lead at NSF. And he said, when you first hear from NSF about negotiating an award, you should initiate that IRB process at your institution. And he went on to say that the, the NSF Division of Grants and Agreements definitely will not accept a proposal that's been recommended for an award if there is not an IRB appro approval or exemption um, on file, unless the program officer has said that there, one isn't needed. So even though you can get by, by with saying that your approval is pending, um, when you submit your proposal, you really do want to be able to move quickly once you hear that you may be funded. All right, so next is the project summary. And this is a, a separate document as well. Um, this is what's going to be used by the NSF program officer to determine how to group all the proposals, um, probably hundreds of proposals that they receive, and then assign them to reviewers. So you really want to start off with a strong and specific statement about what, what your project is about and who it's going to serve. In fact, try to include that key information about your disciplinary focus, your audience, and your main activities right there in the first one or two sentences. The project summary can be up to 4,600 characters. And that comes out to about 750 words or one and a half pages of text. Um, and, and then this is a pretty small space, and you have to provide an overview of your project's activities um, and those things I just mentioned, the, the audience, the focus, and so forth, um, and also specifically address the proposal's intellectual merit and broader impacts. Um, over 40% of you indicated you already have an ATE grant, so you know that those intellectual merit and broader impacts are the NSF review criteria. Um, and there are sub-criteria underneath those main headings. So you may not be able to address them all in, in your limited space in the, this project summary. So you want to focus on the ones that are most relevant to your proposal. Boil down intellectual merit is about the project's potential to advance knowledge. And broader impact is about the project's potential benefits to society. And you want to be aware that the ATE program has some sub-criteria that are related to evaluation. They ask if the evaluation is clearly tied to project outcomes, if it's going to assess student learning effectively, if it will yield useful information, and if it will communicate the results to others. And the fact that the ATE program has incorporated evaluation concerns right into its review criteria, that should be a clue of just how important it is to your proposal. So next comes the project description. And this is the 15-page narrative that is really the bulk of your proposal, where you present your ideas and your work plan. And you have to cover a lot of ground in these 15 pages. The things I've listed here are the key elements of your project description. And I took this right out of the ATE solicitation. I'm pretty sure there's just a list of everything they want you to address in this part of the proposal package. And the two pieces where evaluation needs to come out pretty prominently are the results of prior support and, of course, the evaluation plan. So if the PI, and that's uh, short for principal investigator, the person leading the, the project, if the PI or the co-PI on the proposal has received funding prior, to, prior um, from NSF that's related to this proposal, you have to start your project description with the section that's called Results of Prior Support. And as you can see from this quote, NSF expects you to describe your previous project outcomes and results here. And reviewers are going to be looking for evidence, evidence of the quality and effectiveness of your prior work. And the NSF Grant Proposal Guide says this section should also be organized under two main headings, which again are those review criteria of intellectual merit and broader impacts. So this is where the evaluation of past projects is going to go. So many of you, as, I, as we saw, have um, projects already with ATE. So this is quite relevant to you. You want to be thinking how you're going to put your evidence together and make a compelling case for continued support. You want to keep in mind that not all evaluation results are going to be equally important in the eyes of reviewers. So you, 
you know, you only have 15 pages total, and um, I think up to about five pages for results of prior support. So you may have to be selective in what you report here and give priority to those, you know, more um, those higher level impacts, like student outcome data is going to be more important than the number of people who visited your website or how satisfied um, your participants are. So next, I have an exercise where I'd like you to put yourselves in the position of proposal reviewers. Um, you're going to be using your markers again, but just wait a second on that. So these are statements that could potentially show up in a results of prior support section. And I'd like you to read each statement and indicate um, if you would find this compelling as a reviewer as evidence of either intellectual merit or broader impact of previously funding work. So if you think yes, then mark the box with the thumb under the thumbs up. And if you don't think so, uh, if you think it's rather weak, you could mark the box under the thumbs down. So I'm just going to give you a moment to work on that on your own. And um, you should have your markers tool. Great. Okay, a lot of activity. Okay, so I'm. You can keep. Feel free to keep marking. I'm looking through them. So the prior project achieved all of its goals. So this is important. Um, definitely would want to see here. We would want to see some evidence of goals being met. Um, so I don't. Have convincing. The other issue is it depends on the quality of those goal statements, right? Because sometimes they can be quite ambitious um, and substantial goals. And sometimes there we see goals written as activities. So if, uh, if Evaluate's goal was written as if we our goal is to provide six webinars a year, and we say that we did that, really what is, what is the impact or importance or, or um, value in that? So we'd want to have a little bit more substance there. So the second one, um, the PIs and co-PIs have published four peer-reviewed articles based on data generated by the project. It looks like kind of an even split between people who thought this was good and not so good. I would say it is pretty good evidence of intellectual merit. So it's an external um, confirmation of uh, high quality work, the fact that article peer reviewed articles were published. So I would say this would be definitely an important thing to include uh, as evidence particularly of intellectual merit. And the third one, this is a list of things that the project developed and how many people it served. And this is often, I think, what people default to because it's easy to report. Um, it's easily verifiable. Um, but it really doesn't get at what difference it made. So we served 40 faculty and 125 students, but what happened as a result of that? What changed in their practice or their knowledge level? Did they get jobs and so forth? Um, did they uh, improve their teaching? So it doesn't get at the substance of the kind of the so what. What difference did the project made? So this is perfectly fine to list these kinds of accomplishments, but we want to have a little more um, evidence behind it about about impact and, and more substantial outcomes. So finally, we have the project supported internships for 75 students, and uh, more than half secured full-time positions. So everyone absolutely unanimous that this is good, compelling evidence of a result of prior support, and I definitely would agree with you there. So I think what you want to do um, as you're working on your own proposals is to go ahead, write up your results of prior support, and then give it a critical um, a review like this and ask yourselves, we did this, but so what? And more importantly, ask somebody not associated with your projects to review it and see if they think it's compelling or what's missing. Well, thanks for doing that. So this is that list of uh, components of the project description again. And we're going to skip all the way down to the evaluation plan. Uh, as you can see here, there's a whole lot in between that you need to address from the rationale for the proposal all the way uh, through sustainability um, and, then, and then finally dissemination. But we're here, obviously, to talk about evaluation. So we have another poll for you. Um, Tim, if you could bring up our next poll. Um, of these 15 pages of a proposal, 
How long should the evaluation plan be? Just use the poll in the upper right uh, corner of your screen to register your response. So almost everybody is in there at the one to three pages. A few people saying a little more or a little less. Um, maybe we could. So I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, evaluation plan should be about one to three pages of your proposal. Um, I would aim for about one and a half pages, unless you have good reason to make it you know, more or less than that. But that's a good place to start as a target, because uh, you do only have the, those 15 pages to describe your entire project. And evaluation is important, but you don't want it to necessarily overtake your proposal. But importantly, it, isn't, it is definitely more than a paragraph. You cannot do your evaluation plan justice in uh, a half a page. So in these few pages, you need to identify who's going to evaluate your project and briefly describe his or her experience and expertise related uh, to, to your proposal. Um, really, just maybe a few sentences or a paragraph here. And of course, you'll need to describe what will be evaluated and how. So regarding this first point, the ATE program solicitation specifies that the funds to support an evaluator in the independent of the project or center must be requested. So a common question that proposers ask is, how do I find an evaluator? And it's, it's not an easy thing to do, right? Because there are not uh, listings of them in the yellow pages. Your best resource may well be other ATE PI's recommendations. And a good bet is to ask a center PI, as they tend to have more experience. Um, you can get a listing of all ATE centers from the ATE Central website. The American Evaluation Association also maintains a, a national directory of evaluators, and that's searchable by keyword and region. But definitely check that out. And the links to the AEA directory and ATE Central um, website are included in the checklist that we're sharing with you. And wherever you are, you're probably not all that far from a large university, and you can just investigate to see if they have a research center or institute that engages in evaluation work and make contact with them. But remember, these are these sources are just going to give you leads. Um, just because an evaluator is in a directory or is recommended by another PI doesn't mean they're the right person for, for your project. You really have to determine that person's qualifications and fit with your project for yourself. And that brings me to a quote from our good colleague, Mike Lisecki at Maytech, who's behind the scenes during the webinar today. Uh, he pointed out in a past webinar that starting early is important and that now really is a good time to develop a relationship with an evaluator. So you're already thinking ahead to evaluation in your proposal, and you should definitely be thinking about um, who's going to be on your team in that role. Similarly, Leslie Goodyear, who has also been an NSF program officer, she's now a principal research scientist at EDC, uh, she concurs with that, saying, get the evaluators on board early and really work with them during the proposal development process. So next, we're going to hone in on what should go into the evaluation plan itself. And that's really the most dense part of the webinar. So before we get to that, I'm going to turn things back over to Emma so we can take a moment to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Well, thanks, Lori. And this brings us to our first question and answer break. Uh, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box now. And actually, Lori, you've had a bunch of questions come in through this last session. So the first one is actually from Max. And he asked, are all awards negotiated, and should I expect that? Well, I am not an NSF person, so I can't say for sure, but um, I've had two successful proposals, and there's always been some questions um, that need to be answered. It's usually sort of the things that bubble up in the review process that maybe are of concern or not clarified for the reviewers. And the program officer will communicate those questions to you and ask um, for clarification. I've also experienced that as an evaluator on NSF-funded projects where we got some questions about the evaluation. And, um, I really can't speak to other aspects of, like that's been my experience is having to ask, answer some questions. Um, I do know of people who've been asked to scale back 
a, a proposal, so that's a possibility. But I can't, you know, I can only speak to my limited experience there. But I would, I think it's something that, because I, I kind of maybe was like you, like I thought you'd just get the word, yeah, you've been funded, good, you know, here you go. But it, it may not really pan out that way. There may be a, a process, a, a going back and forth to clarify some things. Well, thanks, Lori. Um, so Allie asked, if the PI and co-PI have not previously led an NSF-funded project, but our institution has successfully conducted it in an NSF project, should we still include information in results of prior support? Well, again, um, I might ask Mike Lisecki to chime in with his opinion in the chat box there, but I'm going to go ahead ahead and tell you what I think. Um, I think if it's just somebody across campus happened to have an NSF project, I don't think that's relevant. I wouldn't find it relevant as a reviewer. If you can show that you're collaborating with those folks or that you're building on their work, um, I think that may be, um, may be a good, a good, there's a case there to be made. Um, I think when you get to the section of your proposal where they ask you to talk about organizational capacity. If you need to convince review, you know, especially if you're a small institution or maybe you might want to convince them of your institution's capacity to handle, you know, grants management and, and that kind of thing. And that might be a more appropriate place to talk about institutional capacity um, to deal with grants. Um, so I would stick to, in the results of prior support, I would really stick to talking about work that's related to uh, the content of the proposal. So a question from Madeline, uh, is the IRB required by the NSF regardless of project scope if it impacts students in any way? Yeah, it's, that is the, 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 what I've, the message I've heard pretty clearly from um, Gerhard Salinger and it's the experience that, that I've had. So you either need to show uh, that you will not be collecting any information about people from or about people, human subjects. Um, and if you are, and it may well be the, that may well be the case, and then you just get a note, uh, or you may not even need to deal with your human subjects review board. Or it may be that, that it, it is a situation where you are going to be collecting that kind of information, but it's not the kind of data that human subjects review boards are concerned with, or you know, and they may just say, oh, you don't need to go through the review process, you're fine. Um, but you will need to have one of those, like either it's no review is necessary, or or you get the um, the approval from the HSIRB, but scope really isn't the issue. It's really about are you collecting information from or about human subjects. Okay. So Christian asks, is it possible to see successful full proposals? Do we have any examples of those? I think I need to, you to say that again, Emma. Sorry. Is it possible to see a full successful proposal? Oh, okay. That is, you know, I think I think there, there may be some floating around. I'll tell you what I know. I know that, um, like, I don't, I don't have any. I'm happy to share ours. When people ask to see ours, I will share with them because I like to be helpful. But um, I know that when NSF actually runs workshops on proposal development, they actually have um, sanitized proposals, real ones that they use. Um, I do not have access to those. You can also just ask PIs. I mean, they may not agree, but if there's, you know, especially like a large center or, um, I don't know, maybe someone who's at your institution, you can always just ask somebody as a colleague, say, you know, be really helpful. Could I, could I see what you've done? Um, but I don't think there's like a pool of them out there. You can, like a library, you can just access. Well, Shelly just posted that Sinclair Community College has two full proposals on their grant web page. So maybe if Shelly is willing to share that URL, um, you could you could jump over there and look at those. Um, so another question did come in from Susan. Does the evaluator have to be a formal external evaluator, or, or could it be a, a subject matter expert relevant to the project? Well, that is a really good question, and it's debatable. Um, I think reviewers and NSF program officers are going to want to see some evaluation expertise um, on the part of your evaluator. Uh, now, that said, I think you can put together uh, like an advisory panel that really has your subject matter experts. And they can play an evalu 
evaluative role, you know, give you feedback on stuff you're developing um, as you're working on it. And I think that's extremely valuable. Another option would be to team up the subject matter expert and the evaluator. Because sometimes it's definitely true. Sometimes it's just, these are technical areas, and it can take time for the evaluator to get up to speed on what the project is doing. Um, so sometimes people just want that person who knows exactly what they're doing already, and they don't have to explain anything to them. But to get a really, you know, pretty strong, compelling evaluation, you really do want somebody with evaluation expertise. So look for somebody with some experience um, in doing evaluation, um, but don't hesitate to augment their expertise with subject matter expertise. Well, to kind of continue to roll with that same topic there, Lori, does your evaluator have to come, or can your evaluator come from within your institution, for example, a data evaluation center? Um, yeah, so there's kind of two ways of being external. There's like a fully external evaluator, so it's somebody outside of your institution, completely independent of your project and your institution. And then there's sort of internal to your institution, but external to your project. And as far as I know, that, and you may want to check with the program officer, um, but as far as I know, that is acceptable as long as you can show that they are, you know, that unit is independent of um, the unit doing the evaluation work, if that makes sense. Like they should be administratively and functionally uh, in independent of one another. So they're, so it's sort of external that way. But as far as I know, that is an acceptable um, way to go. Most in the ATE uh, program, uh, I wish I had the number on, at the tip of my tongue, but I don't. But it's a very large majority do the fully external um, evaluator. Well, thanks, Lori. And a couple other questions have come in, but they're going to be covered in our next section. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Remember, you can keep typing your questions in the chat box um, while we go through the next sections. Um, so just keep those questions coming in, and we'll get them answered. So if you're looking for another great resource um, other than our webinars, make sure to check out our new blog. Um, this came out about six months ago, and it's going really well. This week's post is by Cindy Tanassis, and it's on evaluation and planning partners throughout the journey. And if you're interested in contributing to our blog, we're always looking for new perspectives. And you can find out more information on our website under the blog section. So now I'll turn it back to Lori. Lori, here you go. Well, thanks, Emma, and thank you, everyone, for your really good questions. Um, we have two more questions break, breaks coming up, so do keep your questions coming in the chat box. So now we're going to take a close look at what should go into that evaluation section. An evaluation plan has four basic elements. It needs to identify the evaluation questions, which is defining the focus of the evaluation, the plan for collecting and analyzing data, and the evaluation deliverables and uses, and the logic model. Um, I put it sort of, sort of overarching. And this is a tool that is, I find, extremely helpful for evaluation planning. I, and I kind of, I think I put it last there, pop up last, because this isn't a required thing with the ATE program. It's just very helpful. A lot of people find them very useful. Um, here's an image of the logic model that um, I'm working on for Evaluate. Uh, like probably many of you, we are submitting this fall for a renewal proposal. So I am knee deep in all of this as many of, as, as many of you are. Um, I just find them so useful both for designing a project as well as planning the evaluation. And as I'm working on our proposal, so I'm actually going back and forth um, iteratively between the logic model and my project description and, and especially the evaluation plan to making sure that they're consistent, that I have my cover, bases covered, and that things are making sense across the spectrum. A logic model is just basically, in a sense, a graphic depiction of what a project is doing and trying to achieve. Um, and there's lots of ways to show logic models, and they can get complicated as they try to you know, show the, the relationships between different project components. And this is just an example of a very basic one for a fictional project we've called the Renewable Energy Technology Institute. And I want to point out this is a work of fiction. 
Um, it, we just made it up for the purposes of this webinar and try to keep things simple. And we're going to look at each component, so don't worry right now about trying to take all this information in in these boxes. But do note that the, the intended um, outcomes generally are to get more qualified technicians into jobs in the renewable energy field. So that's what we're working towards. So it's not unusual for logic models to begin with inputs, and those are the resources that we bring to a project. I'm actually starting with activities in this example. So in this column, um, with activities, you convey the main things you're going to do with your grant dollars. And in this example, we have things like the, these faculty workshops, some follow-up support, guest lectures, and so on. And the outputs are the tangible things we're going to be generating with our activities. And these really are things you can count, you can see, you can document. Um, we saw the had, had that example earlier of like so many faculty served and students and lab manuals created. Those are really outputs rather than outcomes. Um, these are the things that are going to remain after the project ends. For our short-term outcomes, um, we want to identify what's going to happen as a direct result of the project activities and outputs. And outcomes should almost always be about changes in people, what they think, what they know, what they're able to do, what their practices are. And here we have um, be going beyond what's happened, going beyond what's happening as an immediate result um, to the next phase. And it, it's helpful to think of these outcomes as a continuum. Um, typically, in the logic models, we see three levels of outcomes, but that's not nothing magic about that. You could have two. So, but in this example, our midterm outcomes are how change, changes in how faculty are teaching and how students are developing competencies that they need in order to get these jobs. And at the highest level of outcomes, um, you want to show how you're meeting that need you identified earlier in your proposal's rationale. Uh, an early part of your project description is about the need for your project. Why are you proposing what you're proposing? Um, so your long-term outcomes or some level of your outcomes should be in direct response to that need that you've described. How are you meeting that need? In this example, we have more students entering green, uh, renewable energy technology careers and employers actually hiring those graduates. Um, like I said, it's typical to show three levels of outcomes, but it's not necessary at all. And for smaller scale projects, especially fewer would be fine. Um, and, but even if you have a small scale project, you could kind of show the, like, this is where we're headed. Like, for in, this, in these two or three years, we're only going to get to short or midterm outcomes, but we're, our, overall, we're working toward these long term outcomes. That can be fine, too, as long as you're clear about it. Um, you do want to make sure that your project outcomes are very obviously aligned with the ATE program goals. And these are about um, producing more qualified technicians to meet workforce demands. And if you do want to include a logic model in your proposal, um, you need to keep it to one page or less. So if you find that you need more space, then you're getting too complicated and you need to start condensing down uh, the pieces of your model. It's really a means to visualize and communicate the salient aspects of your project and how they fit together into a cohesive package. And that's really you know, providing the reviewers of that, that clear overview of what you want to do. And it's also a great platform for laying out the evaluation, which brings us to evaluation questions. And here we have Lana Rux, who currently evaluates external evaluator. And she pointed out in a webinar that she did for us several years ago before she was our evaluator, she said that the logic model acts like a roadmap for decision making around improvement, and also that it provides a foundation for determining what to measure. Again, that's a, an act of focusing the evaluation. Evaluation questions are questions we ask about the project's merit, worth, or significance. You know, those are just synonyms for quality, value, effectiveness, efficiency, things like that. Um, so we're going to answer those questions based on evidence. Um, asking those sort of questions about merit or significance, it means that we really should frame them in a way that demands a value claim for an answer. So we're, and we want to use multiple sources and, of evidence to answer. So we're going to look at some examples to make this a little bit clearer. But it's really important to make sure that 
th these questions really do align with what the project is doing and trying to achieve. And remember, that's actually one of the ATE-specific review criteria. Um, for example, if your project is focusing on developing students' entrepreneurial skills, then don't invest your evaluation resources in assessing their learning in their technical content areas. So having evaluation questions for each main piece of your logic model um, is it's important. So you know, the outcomes, we tend to focus on outcomes, and that's really, it is important. But how we get there is important. And if you want to use evaluation to improve along the way, we've got to have some evaluation questions about the front end stuff as well. So in this project, the evaluation questions um, related to activities are looking at the extent to which the project reaches its intended audience. We might also look at how satisfied participants are with the workshops um, and the support that they're receiving. So as we go through these example evaluation questions, um, pay attention to how the questions, the way I've framed them. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put the question on. There we go. <laughs> so the way I frame them, um, they allow for a continuum of responses. So if you find yourself writing evaluation questions that you could answer with a yes or a no or a single number, those probably aren't, you probably need to work on those a bit. We want to allow for a continuum of responses. With regard to outputs, um, we could ask questions about the quality of those outputs, the modules and the curriculum. Um, we want to know also the extent to which the curriculum, as it's developed, you know, is going to support the development of the competencies that are new, needed by these technicians. And this is an example where that subject matter expert maybe needs to come in to help the evaluator if the evaluator doesn't have expertise in this area. So now we'll move on to evaluation questions related to the outcomes. You can see, I think, how these questions relate to this two-stated short-term outcomes. And this level of outcomes is pretty, typically pretty straightforward to measure because the results are so closely tied to our project activities. It's at, as we move down the, outcome, down the outcomes chain that things get a little trickier. So here we have questions focused on the extent to which the intended outcomes are achieved. Um, when developing evaluation questions, I also want to point out it's important that they're reasonable and answerable. So you don't want big, lofty questions, which may sound great, but you're never going to be able to collect enough information and be able to give a, a convincing answer. So you do want questions that you're pretty sure you're going to be able to address um, with the data that you can collect. So eventually we get to our long-term outcomes. And remember, these um, are often high-level goals. Um, here we're asking about the extent to which the students are getting those certificates and degrees, how, you know, are they actually getting jobs? And you know, if we made a case in the beginning in our, of our proposal that we're doing this because of a regional workforce demand, we'd want to be able to speak to that outcome as well. So in a past webinar, ATE evaluator Penny Billman said that she believed the difference between an average evaluation and a good one is how well those impacts are measured. And oftentimes, people use that term impact as a, to, to refer to those higher level outcomes, the sort of what difference did you make with your project. And here we have a, note, a quote from Gerhard again. He made a sim similar point um, in relation to the ATE program specifically, saying that the evaluation really does need to show how what you're doing increases the competency and quality of technicians, because that is the sort of heart and soul of the ATE program. So the next element of the evaluation plan is the description of your plan for collecting and analyzing data. And I, well, actually, let's go back. Data and analysis, importantly. But I'm going to focus on data collection first. Here you want to describe what information you're going to collect, how you're going to do it, who will provide it, and when. Just you know the basic questions here. So here's an excerpt from an actual proposal for an evaluation. It was not an NSF proposal. But it is real. I did shorten it a bit for this presentation. You're probably reading it as I talk already. So I'm just going to highlight some keywords for you. Um, it says the evaluation is going to use mixed methods. It's going to gather both qualitative and quantitative data. It will be both formative 
informative and address the program's merits and worth. Going to adhere to best practices for rigorously scientifically based research. My highlighting a little off due to our new system, but you get the idea there. A lot of uh, good words um, we see in evaluation a lot. Okay, so it doesn't actually provide any of the key information um, about the what, the how, who, and when of data collection that we really do need to know to show there's an actual plan. Um, it's basically just fluff. It's a very generic cookie cutter description of an evaluation. And it's likely what you'll get if you wait till the last minute to engage an evaluator to help you with your um, proposal. This is definitely not what you want to see in your proposal. All right, you've been listening to me uh, talk a lot, so I'm going to ask you to do a little work next. This is a different example of a data collection plan. Um, think back to those four questions that we need to cover in a data collection plan. What, how, who, and when. And just take a minute to read this example. And then I'll ask you to use the chat box to answer some of those questions. So I'm just going to be quiet while you read and get a drink of water. Okay. First question, what type of information will be collected for this evaluation? So use your, um, use the chat box to give your response about what data will be collected. Okay, Amanda says participant feedback. Max says interviews, Allie also says participant feedback, Carol as well, Elizabeth says survey uh, data. OK, they're really starting to roll in. So you're definitely seeing that information there pretty readily. Um, yep, we have uh, participants, workshop participants feedback, evidence of application, and students' knowledge and perceptions. So next, how is that information going to be collected? Use your chat box again. Julie Eddy hit it right away, surveys and interviews. You, everyone is saying the same thing. So it's quite obvious. There's no mystery here, right? It's surveys and interviews. Those are our main methods. OK, next, who will provide the data for this evaluation? Yeah, pretty much everyone saying participants and students, students and participants, right? Again, pretty clear. Uh, we're going to get data from the workshop participants and the students. And some of you noted as well that who is going to do the collecting of the data, the project staff and the external evaluator. You also picked up on that in this. And finally, when is the data going to be collected? You guys are on it. You got it. Um, end of workshop and six months post workshop and the end of each semester. So obviously this is just you know three sentences of what would be a one to three page description or, of your evaluation, and it's just those three sentences are just a small example of how data collection might be described within that overall evaluation plan. But it doesn't have to be a mystery, as we saw in that first example. You can get pretty concrete. So here's some tips for thinking about data collection. Think about it in terms of building a body of evidence, using multiple sources of data as well as multiple methods. It's really great if you can embed data collection into regular project activities just from a feasibility standpoint. Uh, if, for example, if you need to do students to do a survey, um, have them do it as part of a class rather than trying to track them down later. You're going to get much better response rates if you work with captive audiences. Um, use existing data whenever possible. So 
you know, you probably also want to get to know your institutional research office staff and find out what's accessible within your institution without having to collect new data. And if possible, utilize existing data collection instruments, you know, if you can find them, if they match your needs. And that'll save you time developing and validating new instruments. So with regard to analysis, unless you're using some complex procedures, you don't need a whole lot here. But you do need to convey that you've thought ahead to how you're going to deal with the data, make sense of the data that you plan to collect. And that's really the heart of analysis, is making sense of the data um, that's actually you know, interp an interpretive process. Um, and you might also want to think about how, um, what sorts of comparisons you will make in order to reach a value of conclusions. Um, how are you going to assign meaning to what you're seeing? Are things going well or not going well? So, you know, ex examples include like looking at um, data over time if you can, if you have some baseline data, or looking at other sites, or if you can create comparison groups. But typically, to get a really good, you know, interpretation going, you've got to compare your results with something else, even if it's internal information. Um, you just want to be clear about how you're going to basically translate your data into answers to your evaluation questions. Because a common problem is in, in evaluation is that you, you'll see evaluation questions presented, but then there isn't ever really an answer to them. Um, and, and you actually do want to answer them. An efficient way to present your data collection analysis plan is to put it in a matrix like this one. And so here you can see we have our project it are, excuse me, our evaluation question. And then there's a column for the indicator, which are the pieces of information you're going to collect. And then the next column identify the sources of data, the methods, who's responsible, and when it will happen. So all those basic questions of, uh, are addressed. And then here we also have some uh, area for notes about the analysis plan. So if you want to take a closer look at this example, it is in the, the PDF of the slides that we posted on our website, because I know it's a lot to take in here in this webinar format. Finally, you should describe the evaluation deliverables and how you're going to use the information. And remember that two of the ATE-specific review criteria are about how the evaluation information from the evaluation is going to be fed back into the project, as well as um, be used to inform broader audiences. So this point in, from the solicitation has been echoed by ATE program officers, like Connie Della Piana, who in last year's webinar on this topic advised proposers to talk about how they're going to use the results of their evaluation. And Elizabeth Tellis, um, she said, to design the evaluation to provide evidence about what is and isn't working. So it's really not just about proving that you're doing a good job. If that's the only thing you're doing your evaluation for, you're not going to get as much value out of it. It's about using evaluation as a tool for improvement as well as a means of being accountable to the National Science Foundation. So in your proposal's evaluation plan, you at least need to describe what types of reports will be developed and how those results will be shared. And keep in mind that you'll need information from the evaluation for other purposes, like your annual report to NSF um, for the annual survey of grantees that we at Evaluate conduct, and possibly reports to advisory groups as well. So for this 15-page project description, we've looked at results of prior NSF support and the evaluation plan. Um, if you want to learn more about sustainability and dissemination, which are cross-cutting topics just like evaluation, I encourage you to visit the ATE Central website. And they have great resources on these topics. So it's time for our next question break. Um, so I'll hand it over to Emma. Well, thanks, Lori. That was some great information. As Lori mentioned, we are in our section, second question and answer break. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box now. Um, Lori, here's a question for you. You mentioned that logic models often start with inputs, but your example started with activities. Why is that? Oh, good question. So that's really just because so often I see logic models where the import, inputs really aren't that meaningful. So if you have really unusual or exceptional resources, 
uh, that you're bringing to the, the work that you're proposing, then I definitely think it's worth including them in the logic model. If you're building on prior work, um, that definitely could be highlighted in the inputs area. But if, it, if all you have, you know, if all you're going to put is NSF funding and faculty expertise and maybe, you know, so, stuff like that, you can just leave it out because that's pretty much implied in all NSF proposals. There's really no right or wrong, you know, whether to put inputs, you know, first or um, activities. If you want to highlight project inputs and you have the space in your logic model to do it, then definitely include them. But um, in this case, I just chose to start with activities because I think that's probably where most people are going to begin. But it's not wrong to start with inputs. And again, I think if you have really important ones that um, you know highlight what your the foundation for your project and really good resources that are going to um, be able to sort of help you along with what your work then definitely include definitely excuse me begin with input awesome so how do you know how many logic model elements to have one for each activity you will be doing then how many evaluation questions should you have one per logic model component how do you figure all that out yeah and that's why you kind of have to go back and forth with developing the logic model as you're developing your proposal but here's a clue look if you have to Put, print out your logic model on special paper, you know, beyond eight and a half by eleven, it's too big. So one thing to do is to, if you start like, you know, you have ten different activities, um, start combining things, you know, into categories. Uh, like we do webinars and workshops, so I'm not going to list, you know, all every webinar and every workshop. I'm, I chunk it together and call it professional development, you know, or, or training and education and so forth, because, you know, it's not about having an exhaustive account of every single thing you're trying to do and, um, and every single change you're bringing about. It's really an, a big picture. It's an overview. And if you're putting it in your proposal, it's to help reviewers understand what you're doing. And you don't want them to be bogged down in like tons and tons of detail. It's supposed to be a, a simpler view than the narrative version. As for evaluation questions, um, I kind of my rule of thumb is to try to start with one question for each section of the model. So activities, uh, you know, through the outcomes. Um, you can always pose sub questions under the larger questions if you need to break um, break down those overarching questions if necessary. But so if there's seven, no, there's five main sections of your logic model. Why oh, am I not remembering that? I think five, right? Then you know start there and, and maybe uh, go up and down as necessary. But if you know you have 20 evaluation questions, you need, again, you need to start condensing things. You should you know, think about it like that typical elevator speech. So if, you're, if you, somebody says, oh, well, what is your evaluation looking at? You should be able to just tell them in a clear, clear way without you know, having to bring out a big you know, thick document or anything. So that's not a like hard and that's not hard and fast answer, right? But something you have to work through, and you just want to keep things manageable. So we actually have three questions that have come in. Um, they're similar. I'm going to just feed you the one first. So, is it necessary to have a logic model in the narrative, or can it just be used as a guide for planning? And to kind of add on to that, um, do you need to include every question in your description of the logic model in the body of your evaluation plan? Well, so as to where to put the logic model, um, I think it, you know it's up to you. So you have 15 pages of your proposal. If you want to use a half a page or a full page for your logic model, if you think it will um, at, you know bring improve your proposal in the eyes of reviewers, then include it in the body of the proposal. But it's I know a lot of people sometimes. Um, we'll just put it in with the supplementary documents. I can't. I think you have. I don't remember. You have a certain number of pages you can attach with your proposal that's supplementary documents. So those are things you can, you know, that reviewers may or may not look at. They're, I don't think they're required to look at them. So that's very common is to say, you know, see our logic model and our supplementary documents for more information. Um, but I do think it's a good communication tool, and it really helps show the cohesion of your project activities and outputs and outcomes. Um, but it's also good for planning. But I would say if you're going to go to the trouble of making one, and it's a good one, at least put it in with your supplementary documents. And then the other question about listing questions um, in our description of the logic model. Uh, 
you know, I actually put our evaluation questions right under the components of the logic model in the logic model because I have the space to do it. And I like to show very clearly that our evaluation is looking through the entire spectrum of our activities through our outcomes. Um, that's just sort of a reinforcing thing that I choose to do. It, but you do need to put your evaluation questions in your in your evaluation plan. And it should just be clear how those map on to your logic model. And if you're not going to have questions that all go all the way out to your you know, furthest uh, desired outcomes, I think, like I said, I think that can be OK as long as you're clear about why you're not including them. Great. Well, well thanks, Lori. Um, we had one other question that came in during our first section that we weren't able to cover. Uh, what advice do you have for people who are not allowed by their institution to pre-select an evaluator for their proposal? Um, yeah, so I actually, that's a tricky issue. And um, I actually just, we just have a couple pieces on that, or a piece on that in our latest newsletter. And uh, in a in a recent blog um, by Jacqueline Reary. but so th the first thing to do would be to contact your procurement office or whatever it's called on your campus to um, to figure out what is and isn't possible, and then and then work from there. But make sure you know your institution and your state's rules and regulations and so forth. And the mo I think the most important thing to do, if you're not able to identify an evaluator and name them in your proposal and all that, if that's not allowed by your institution, be really clear in your evaluation section about that policy and you know what it dictates about what you can and can't do. And then be really clear about how you're going to get an evaluator once you're funded. Um, and then I would try to work with somebody. If you can't work with an evaluator, um, work with somebody on your campus who maybe has some experience in developing at least you know, a basic outline for an evaluation plan. I have, a, like I said, a, a, a short article in our latest newsletter sort of about how you can go about that if you, have to, if you seriously have to do it all by yourself without working with an evaluator. But again, the most important thing would be to be super clear so it's really clear for reviewers about the fact that you can't do it and why and what you're going to do to get an evaluator on board as quickly as possible. Well, thanks for coming those questions, Lori, and thanks everyone for your great questions. Remember, you can continue to type those questions in the chat box as we continue through the final section. We did want to make sure you were aware of the following opportunities for ATE evaluators at the 2015 ATE PI conference, which will take place on October 21st through the 23rd in Washington, DC this year. Uh, we do have conference funding for evaluators. Um, we're able to fund up to 10 ATE evaluators for travel and registration expenses for the ATE PI conference. And the application deadline for that is August 28th. We're also encouraging you to apply for the session, session track five, which is advancing innovation through STEM research and evaluation there at the ATEPI conference. And then also, if you're interested, we do have a pre-conference workshop that Lori will be putting on called Midlife Project Evaluation, setting the stage for continued funding. So there are just a few great options that are happening at the ATEPI conference that we wanted to make sure you were aware of. Let's continue on with Lori for more advice on incorporating evaluation into your ATE proposal. Lori? Yeah, so now we're going to go through the other pieces of your proposal. Um, if you're like me, you probably kind of default to thinking of the proposal as that 15-page narrative. But there's actually a lot more pieces that need to be assembled um, and developed. And many of them require information related to evaluation, like the references document. So evaluation should be evidenced in your references. It helps demonstrate the evaluator's knowledge and competence. It can also help show how the evaluation is grounded in and building on current knowledge and practice. And if you're going to apply a specific evaluation approach or instrument, um, you can provide citations to support its use in your particular context. So ask your evaluator to embed appropriate references in the plan. <clears throat> excuse me, and to provide you with those citations so you can include them here. And you'll want to include a bio sketch from your evaluator. Um, actually, so this, we have a poll here for you. If we could just open that next poll. 
And here I'd like to know um, whether you're an evaluator or a PI, just like for the proposal that you're working on for the fall, has an evaluator been selected already for this proposal? OK, so it's looking fairly evenly, but a little bit more than around half, close to half say that yes. OK. OK, so now is the time to start that ball rolling and getting an evaluator on board with your proposal. Because um, one of the things you're going to need is that bio sketch from them. It should reflect his or her past experience in conducting project evaluations. And you want to use the NSF format. So this, again, is something it's, it's good to give the person a heads up, because if they don't have a two-page uh, NSF formatted bio sketch, it will take them you know, a little, at least a little bit of time um, to do. So give them a heads up so they can prepare that for you. Um, you actually include this bio sketch of the evaluator in the supplementary document section because in the fast lane system for proposals, the area for uploading bio sketches is for senior personnel only. So that means the PI and any co-PIs. So even though you're going to format it like a bio sketch, you're going to put it in the supplementary document section. Of course, the budget and the budget justification is a really important part of your proposal. And you definitely need to have a line item for evaluation here. So you may recall this quote from earlier in the webinar. And the rest of the quote is that the funds must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. But that isn't terribly specific guidance you're getting from NSF. So let's consider this more carefully. The general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project cost should be allocated for evaluation. That's for evaluation in any context. That's just in general, not, in, not just AT or NSF. It's just whatever context you're working from. So that's a good place to start. And then you can go up or down from that figure, depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project. The reality is that current expenditures on evaluation among ATE grantees averages around 7%. And that average includes you know, small grants as well as multi-million dollar centers. So this graphic shows um, we've divided all projects by into quartiles by the size of their annual budget. So what you can see here is that the larger projects tend to spend a, a little bit more on evaluation. And the and the smaller projects um, a little bit less. So what goes into that budget? The main costs are any evaluation are the evaluator's time and any travel required by the evaluators. Um, materials is typically a small expense. Also, any institutional indirect or overhead costs, but that varies a lot by institution. So I'm not covering it here. But in terms of time, the key question is, how many days does the evaluator need to spend in order to generate the needed deliverables and services? Um, the evaluator is going to have to give you an estimate of the number of days required for the main evaluation tasks. And you're going to need to specify the number of days for the evaluator in your budget, as well as their daily rate. Travel expenses, I'm sure as you know, can really add up. So you want to make sure it's included in the evaluation budget if any is going to be required. Um, especially with small projects, it can really eat, eat up a small project's budget. So will you want the evaluator to attend the PI conference, any advisory committee member meetings or other events? Will they need to travel to collect data from participants? Or um, I think probably most importantly, to meet with project staff to plan the evaluation and discuss results. So how you submit the budget for an evaluation depends on whether the evaluation is done via consultancy or subaward. For consultants, um, and this is typically an individual or a private firm, um, in your overall budget justification, you need to explain the evaluation costs, again, including the evaluator's daily rate and time committed to the project, as well as travel and materials. For subawards, and that's typically with an institution, like a, a university, the evaluator will need to prepare a detailed budget and separate budget justification, just like those done for the primary project. And this is done using NSF, NSF's budget template, which looks like this. And you can download it from Fastlane to provide it, with, provide it to the evaluator. 
I mentioned Jacqueline earlier. She's a grant specialist at Virginia Western Community College. And she wrote, recently wrote a blog entry for us. Um, she advised proposers to touch base with their procurement offices early in the evaluation development process to get clarity on how the evaluation piece should be addressed in the budget and bu budget justification. And that's one of the key questions, is if it's a consultancy or a subaward. So finally, you have your supplementary documents. In this section, you'll want to include a commitment letter from your evaluator, so you're demonstrating that person's individual and organizational commitment to work on the project. Um, when I do commitment letters, they're, they're actually not issued by me personally as a staff member at my university, but uh, by my um, uh, vice president for research. Um, so we co-sign it, but it has to come from them. It may be different at other institutions. Um, but it's showing that the, the organization and the person are, are, are going to work on the project if it's funded. It's also in this supplementary document section is where you're going to put the evaluator's bio sketch, as I mentioned before. And you have to have a data management plan included here as well. So the data collected as part of the evaluation should be addressed in this plan, as well as any other data or important products generated by the pro project. So just briefly, here's a list of the required elements of data management plans. And I'm encouraging you to check out ATE Central's resources on this topic. Uh, the, like I said, data management plans should cover evaluation data as well as um, resources generated by the project. So with that, we've covered all the proposal pieces where information related to your evaluation needs to show up. So um, we're going to have our last Q&A session in just a minute. And right after that, we're going to have that survey that you all agreed to do, if you happen to remember that. But first, I'd like to know how we did today in terms of um, helping you know what evaluation elements need to go into your proposal and how a strong evaluation plan could strengthen your proposal. So I'm going to ask you to do, do what you did before and grab those markers, and we'll see how we did. I'm sure we're going to be able to do a very sophisticated analysis on these, on these results. You're going to see these questions again on our survey. And that's a study for us to go to different ways of asking the same question. I think I see improvement. I'm pretty happy with it. Excellent. Thank you. So Emma, I think I'll turn it over to you now for our last um, batch of questions. Well, thanks, Lori. So as Lori mentioned, this is the final question and answer break. So if you do have any pending questions out there, please enter them in the chat box now. Uh, we did get a question in, Lori, from Hazel Associates regarding the program development and improvement and curriculum and educational materials development project. And is there any advantage to invoking the common guidelines for ed R&D? Oh. OK, thankfully, I can read that question, too, because that is a lot of it. Yes. So program development improvement is a program track in ATE. And curriculum and educational materials development projects is a program track in ATE. So um, I think you've got it in, in the common guidelines for education. That is referring to, actually, if you go to our website and type in common guidelines, we have a, a graphic overview and a series of checklists that really distills the key content. And those are um, guidelines set forth by the National Science Foundation and the Institute for Education Sciences. And they're guidelines for education development and research. And there's been some debate within ATE about how those apply to the ATE context, because ATE is so heavily focused on implementation and doing, and less on research and testing. But absolutely check them out. And if they're appropriate for your um, project, I mean, I, I absolutely think you need to demonstrate knowledge and awareness of those guidelines. And you just have to decide if are you doing a development project, are you doing a research project, then absolutely you need to follow those guidelines and refer to them and show you have mastery of them um, and that your project is designed with them in mind. Great. So uh, another question for you. Is it OK for projects just to use an internal evaluator? Um, I think it for possibly for very small projects. Planning grants uh, don't require evaluation, so that one I think you definitely could get by with an internal evaluator. Um, 
small projects new to ATE, that's a track for you know, what it's called, small projects new to ATE. I think you still need to have somebody. Um, they're pretty, the solicitation is pretty clear. Like you have to have an independent evaluator. So just someone on your project team probably isn't going to cut it. If you have good reason, like there you you have internal expertise and and all that, you might want to go ahead and check with the program officer to see because you don't want to get dinged on that at the you know when it's in review. Um, we have a lot of ex evaluation expertise here where I work, but we we have an external evaluator as well. We do we kind of split the work. We have some internal, but we definitely have that external piece. Great. Um, so Allie had a question. Uh, does anyone have an example of a data management plan that they could share? I would, again, encourage Allie to go to the ATE Central website. I think they actually have examples. Um, and if she wants to email us offline, I can share ours. I'm not sure it's that, you know, our, we're kind of unique, kind of a support center on evaluation, but I'd be happy to share ours as well. If you go to our, if she goes to our website and puts in data management plan, we've got a few resources there as well. I think we have a newsletter article that lists um, several different tools that are out there um, to help people develop these management plans that are, that are quite useful. So there's definitely a lot of resources out there on it. Well, thanks so much, Lori. Uh, it looks like you answered at least questions, so that's good. So this actually brings us to the end of our time together. Um, as Lori mentioned, um, we are going to ask you to go ahead and take a moment to take our survey. Tim, if you want to go ahead and bring that up for us. Um, we will ask you how we did today, and then it, this will help us tailor our future content and provide you with the best experience we can for in the future. So while you're taking that, we'd like to thank you for your participation in today's webinar. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And on behalf of Evaluate and all of us here, we'd like to thank you so much for being with us and have a great day.